Hey y'all, welcome to more of Pleasure with Profit. Today I'm going to look at mechanical recreations. We're going to be building things, I suppose, of engines by help of which we may raise a very great weight with small strength. The invention of all these engines depend upon one sole principle, which is that the same force that can lift up a weight, for example, of 100 pounds to the height of one foot can lift up one of 200 pounds to the height of half a foot or one of 400 pounds to the height of a fourth part of a foot. And so of the rest, be there ever so much applied to it. So if you've taken physics in high school, you might recognize this as work, which is the product of the force or the component of the force vector going in a certain direction multiplied by the distance it goes. And work is related to potential energy and therefore is conserved, which is why this works. And this principle cannot be denied. If we consider that the effect ought to be proportioned to the action that is necessary for the production of it, so that if it be necessary to employ an action by which we may raise a weight of 100 pounds to the height of two foot, for to raise one such to the height of one foot only the same ought to weigh 200 pounds for it's the same thing to raise 100 pounds to the height of one foot, and again, yet another 100 pounds to the height of one foot as to raise one of 200 pounds to the height of one foot, and the same also as to raise 100 pounds to the height of two feet. So there you go with that early modern explanatory style, which is not always fully clear, but definitely detailed. Now the engines which serve to make this application of a force which acteth at a great space upon a weight which it causeth to be raised by a lesser, yes, are trochela. I am going to butcher this so badly. Trochela the pulley, the inclined plane. <laughs> it's plain like boring. So now, now I wonder, actually, well, early modern spelling was not standardized in any way, so I'm wondering, well, P-L-A-N-E became common. What is this? Cuneus, the wedge? Hmm. Axis in peritrochio. The crane, caftan, or wheel. All right, cochlea, the screw. Vectus? I think it's Vectus. <laughs> the lever. I think, well, yeah, I mean, lever. Some people still say that L-E-V-E-R is sometimes the lever in some dialects of English. And some others, for if we will not apply or compare them one to another, we cannot well number more. And if we will, will apply them, we need not instance in so many. Not entirely sure I know what he's saying there. Oh, wait. Oh, look, it's pulleys. What's going on with the pulleys? There is always one thing that hinders the exactness of the calculation. That is the ponderosity of the cord or pulley and the difficulty that we meet with in making the cord to slip and in bearing it, but... This is very small in comparison of that which raiseth it, and cannot be estimated save within a small matter. And yes, that's true. You end up needing some calculus to do that, and I would have to check that calculus was either not really developed or fairly primitive at the time when this book was written. So what do we have? Of the inclined plane. If not having more force than sufficeth to raise an hundred pounds, one would nevertheless 
raise this body f that weigheth 200 pounds to the height of the line va there needs no more but to draw or roll it along the inclined plane ca which i suppose to be twice as long as the line ab for by this means for to make it arrive at the point a we must there employ the force that is necessary for the raising 100 pounds twice as high and the more inclined this plane shall be made, so much the less force shall be need to raise the weight F. But there is to be rebated from this calculation the difficulty there is in moving the body F along the plane AC if that plane were laid down upon the line BC, all the parts of which I suppose to be equidistant from the center of the Earth. Yes. Yes, it's nice to state your assumptions, and certainly that's true. You end up with a slightly different force of gravity otherwise. It is true that this impediment being so much less as the plane is more united, more hard, more even, and more polite, and I wonder what that means in this context, it cannot be likewise estimated but by guess, and it is not very considerable. We need not neither much to regard that the line BC being a part of circle that hath the same center with the Earth, the plane AC ought to be, though but very little curved, which is very little curved, and to have the figure or part of a spiral described between two circles, which likewise have for their center that of the earth, for that is not any way sensible. <laughs> yes, no, it's not. It is not any way sensible to deal with that. I mean, we're looking at something that's the scale of a human type of construction here. So no, the curvature of the earth is not worthwhile to think about. Of the wedge, of the crane capstan or wheel. Hmm, what else do we have here? So sort of going over a lot of different things. Let me go back here. We see also very easily that the force wherewith the wheel A or cog B is turned, which make the axis or cylinder C to move, about which a cord is rolled, to which the weight D, which we would raise, is fastened, ought to have the same proportion to the said weight as the circumference of the cylinder half to the circumference of a circle, which that force describeth, or that the diameter of the one hath to the diameter of the other, for that the circumferences have the same proportions as the diameters, mm, true, insomuch as the cylinder C having no, no more but one foot in diameter, if the wheel AB be six feet in its diameter, and the weight D do weigh 600 pounds, it shall suffice that the force in B shall be capable to raise an 100 pounds, an 100 pounds, why? Okay, early modern grammar, y'all. And so of others. One may also, instead of the cord that rolleth about the cylinder C, place there a small wheel with teeth or cogs, that may turn another greater, and by that means multiply the power of the force as much as one shall please without having anything to deduct of the same save only the difficulty of moving the machine as in the others. So he's referring to friction here. Unto this faculty of the wheel may be referred the force of all those engines which consist of wheels with teeth in them. And from hence also may be discerned the reason why sundry instruments in common use are framed as hand mills, the piercer, the gimlet, etc., as in the figure all which are but several kinds of this fourth faculty, the wheel, in all which instruments the points A, B, C do represent the places of the power, the fulfillment, and the weight. The power being in the same proportion unto the weight as B, C is unto B, A. 
So it's mechanical advantage and so on. of the screw. When once the force of the capstan and of the inclined plane is understood, that of the screw is easy to be computed, for it is composed only of a plane much inclined, which windeth about the cylinder, and if this plane be in such manner inclined, as that the cylinder ought to make VGR, I'm not sure, 10 turns to advance forwards the length of a foot in a screw, and that the bigness of the circumference of the circle which the force that turneth about doth describe be of 10 feet. And I'll have to look up that symbol. I think it means and. At any rate, so as much as 10 times 10 or 100, one man alone shall be able to press it strongly with this instrument or screw as 100 without it, provided always that we rebate the force that is required to the turning of it. Now I speak here of pressing rather than of raising or removing in regard that it is about this most commonly that the screw is employed but when we would make use of it for the raising of weights, instead of making it to advance into a female screw, we join or apply unto it a wheel of many cogs, in such sort made that if this wheel have thirty cogs, whilst the screw maketh one entire turn, it shall not cause the wheel to make more than the thirtieth part of a turn. And if the weight be fastened to a cord, that rolling about the axis of this wheel shall raise it but one foot in the time that the wheel makes one entire revolution, and that the greatness of the circumference of the circle that is described by the force that turneth the screw about be also of ten feet, by reason that ten times thirty makes three hundred, one single man shall be able to raise a weight of that bigness, with this instrument, which is called the perpetual screw, as would require 300 men without it. Provided as before that we thence deduct the difficulty that we meet with in turning of it, which is not properly caused by the ponderosity of the weight, but by the force or matter of the instrument, which difficulty is more sensible in it than in those of foregoing, so as much as it hath greater force. So, in other words, the friction is a property of the machine you are using and not as much a property of the weight you are lifting. The lever. Having, to, uh, having deferred to speak of the lever until the last in regard that it is of all engines for raising of weights the most difficult to be explained. So, I mean, maybe? I don't know. I've, I've always thought that the screw was actually the most difficult to explain, and I've taught physics and, and had to explain this kind of thing. So, let me see. So, we're, okay, real quick here, we're, we're describing the semicircle. Oh, yeah, okay, so it, it's a mechanical advantage thing where the point where you're moving the lever, the lever, is A, B, C, D, E. It's part H, the semicircle, F, G, H, I, K. And that the weight which we would raise by help of it were in H. Right, and then the force in C. The line C, O being supposed triple of O, H. Then let us consider that in the time whilst the force that moveth this lever describeth the whole semicircle A, B, C, D, E, though that the weight describeth likewise the semicircle F, G, H. Okay, so A, B, C is at the top left of that picture. F, G, H is at the bottom right where the weight is. Yet it is not raised to the length of this curved line, 
F G H I K, but only to that of the line F O K. Yeah, yeah that's true. Insomuch that the proportion that the force which moveth this weight ought to have to its ponderosity ought not to be measured by that which is between the two diameters of these circles or between the two circumferences, as it hath been lay, uh, said before of the wheel, but rather by that which is between the circumference of the greater and the diameter of the lesser. Okay, I see what he's getting at, because you're raising the weight straight up by making a curved motion. Furthermore, let us consider that there is a necessity that this force needeth not be so great as such time as it is near to A, which is the top, or near to E, for the turning of the lever, as then when it is near to B or to D, nor so great when it is near B or D, as then when it is near to C. So in other words, when the, when the lever is flat, sort of horizontal, you need the most force. I, I, okay, I see why he's saying this is the most difficult, because the sort of the naive high school physics version of this isn't all that bad, but if you really think about it in detail, then yes, you're describing a semicircle with your handle from A through B down to E, and then the weight is being lifted straight up and so on, so the work involved is a little bit complicated to think about. Where were we? Of which the reason is that the weights there do mount less as it is easy to understand if having supposed that the line COH, so the lever itself, is parallel to the horizon and that AOF cutteth it at right angles, we take the point G equidistant from the points F and H and the point B equidistant from A and C, and that having drawn GS perpendicular to FO, hmm, where's F? Oh, I see. Now I've lost my place. Yeah. We observe that the line FS, which sheweth how much the weight mounteth in the time that the force operates along the line AB, is much lesser than the line SO, which sheweth how much it mounteth in the time that the force operates along the line BC. So he's going on to explain sort of an intuitive version of the mathematics of this which, yeah, takes a while. That's interesting, though. The, oh, that's the uh, Archimedes screw. I see the word Archimedes there. The water screw. Huh. An attempt at perpetual motion. Uh, making water to rise, so you're basically turning the screw here, and it raises water up. How do you try to make perpetual motion out of this? Unfolding the triangle. Okay. Oh, okay, here we are. How it hath been by some supposed that from this water screw a perpetual motion may be contrived. For, say they, if there were but such a water wheel made on this instrument upon which the stream that is carried up may fall, in its descent it would turn the screw round, and by that means convey as much water up as is required to move it, so that the motion must needs be continual, since the same weight which in its fall does turn the wheel is by the turning of the wheel carried up again. Yeah, so that kind of thing does sound tempting. The problem is that, as he pointed out with the other machines, some of the force you have to use goes to overcoming the resistance within the machine itself. It's friction, and so you lose a little bit of energy 
every time. Or if water falling upon one wheel would not be forcible enough for this effect, why? There might be two or three or more, according as the length and elevation of the instrument will admit, by which means the weight of it may be so multiplied in the fall that it shall be equivalent to twice or thrice that quantity of water which ascends as may be more plainly discerned by the figure. Whoa, what have we here? So the water is going from pot like E, F, and G down each time and sort of turning the wheel more than once, I think. LM presents a wooden cylinder with helical cavities cut in it. Tin plates, three water wheels upon it, H, J, K. Okay. The lower cistern, which contains the water being C, D. There is, oh, it's just that bottom part. All the water which from the cistern ascends through it will fall into the vessel at E, supposedly, and from that vessel being conveyed upon the water wheel H. So it's overflowing. That's a little bit hard to see. So in other words, it's overflowing out of E. There's a little pipe there. You can maybe see it, and it's going into... Uh, vessel F by way of the water wheel H, and then F is going into G and turning wheel I, and G is just going back into the cistern by way of water wheel K. From that vessel being conveyed upon the water wheel H, give a circular motion to the whole screw. Yeah. Descend on wheel I, by which means the force of it will be doubled. Yeah, but there's less water every time. And if this be yet insufficient, then may the water which falls on the second wheel I be received into the other vessel G, and from thence again descend on the third wheel at K, and so for as many other wheels as the instrument is capable of. If all the water falling upon one wheel would be able to turn it round, then half of it would serve with two wheels. Although what is here said concerning the probability of affecting such a motion, yet trial and experience have discovered the contrary and found it wholly insufficient. And that first, for that the water that ascends will not make any considerable stream in the fall, and secondly, the stream, though multiplied, will not be of force enough to turn about the screw. Right, because there's only the same amount of water coming down as went up that you're splitting it in the stream so sort of the mass of the water i think that's that's my intuitive reason why it won't work a mechanical paradox or a new and diverting experiment oh this is probably some sort of center of mass shenanigans whereby a heavy body shall by its own weight move up a sloping ascent so we need a roller of wood, a figure like as here is represented at AB, cones. Oh yes, I know what this is. Hey, where's my picture? It said there was a picture. Well, let's find the picture. Da -da -da -da, length. A, B, about three times the thickness. Two straight, smooth rulers about a yard in length. Strong enough to bear the weight of the... Yeah, I've seen this. Lastly, you must have three pieces of wood to support the ends of the rulers. The first about two or three inches thick. The other two, to stand at D enough, must be thicker than this first by somewhat less than half the diameter of the roller. Okay, so place the two thicker pieces upon a level table. Where's the picture? But set the other piece of wood almost the length of the roulard off of the other two. The reason of this seeming ascent of the rom or roller is a real descent or lowering of its center of gravity. See, I called it. I swear I haven't read this before. For 
though the way or line of the motion on the rulers be in ascent, yet the line which the roller describes on its own surface is such that every point of it approaches nearer to the axis of the ROM, the opening of the rulers causing the contact to be nearer to the small ends of the two cones, consequently nearer to the axis. Where's the picture? Why have I no picture? I think this, wait, have we gone to historical rec No, this is still mechanical recreations. There's a lot of these. Statical recre, okay, so the next chapter will be statical. Next time I do a video like this on this book, it'll be statical. So this next part, sort of interesting, it's just historical um, accounts of interesting mechanical devices. So I won't read all of these. Let's just find some at random. Um, Pliny, in the 14th chapter of his 36th book, relates that in the Ephesian temple dedicated to Diana, there were 127 columns made of so many several stones, each 60 foot high, and which stones were digged out of the quarries in Asia. This temple was fired seven times, i.e. burned the last time by Aerostratus, only to get himself a name to posterity. So this is just cool anecdotes about construction. The house of Nero, which he called Domum Orum by Suetonius, is thus described. In the porch was placed a colossus shaped like himself of 120 foot high. The spaciousness of the house was such that it had in it three galleries, each of them a mile long. Goodness. A standing pool like a sea beset with buildings in manner of a city. Imagine having a house the size of a city. Fields in which were arable and pasture grounds, vineyards and woods, with a multitude of tame and wild beasts of all kinds. In the other parts thereof, all things were covered with gold and distinguishing with precious stones or mother of pearl. The supping rooms were roofed with ivory movable for the casting down of flowers and pipes in them for the sprinkling of ointments. <laughs> That's actually funny to think about. Imagine eating. You're, you're eating supper and then all of a sudden panels in the ceiling open up and like ointment comes down <laughs> and flowers out of the ceiling there. So decadent. The roof of the principal supping room was round, which like the heavens day and night moved round about. See this? This gives the sense of being legendary, but you never know with ancient emperors. So th this has a distinctly propagandistic feel to it, like, look how decadent Nero was. This house, when he had thus finished and dedicated it, he said then that he began to live like a man. <laughs> wow. Okay, there's lots of cool stuff in here. I'll make sure I link the book in the video description. So we have one more chapter here, chapter 13 an account of some such admirable pieces of work of several kinds made by several eminent artists, both ancient and modern, which have been by diverse historians and others related, and of some in this our present age. So, more interesting historical things. Looks like we're starting out with automata. Regio Montanus, a famous geometrician of Nuremberg, made an eagle of wood and a fly of iron. This eagle he put to flight out of the city, which raised itself aloft into the air and met the Emperor Maximilian a good way off. As he was coming towards it and having saluted him, returned again to the city gates. This is seeming very legendary. I... maybe... That really happened, it seems unlikely. But let's continue. The fly, at a feast, flew forth of his hand, and taking a round about the table, returned to his hand again. Of these two admirable pieces of workmanship, wormanship? What? Wormanship, performed by geometrical proportion, Debartus thus writeth. 
Why should not I that wooden eagle mention a learned German's late admired invention, which mounting from the fist that framed her flew far to meet an Almain emperor, and having met him with her nimble train, and wearied wings turning about again followed him close unto the city gate of Nuremberg, whom all their shows of state streets hanged with arras arches rarely built, gray-headed senate and youth's gallantries graced not so much as did this one device. Then he describes the fly, the fly, as followeth. Once as the artist more with mirth than meat feasted some friends whom he esteemed great from unders okay from unders hand an iron fly flew out which having flown a perfect round about with weary wings returned to her master and as judicious on his arm he placed her o oh, divine wit that in the narrow womb of a small fly could find sufficient room for all those springs, wheels, counterpoise, and chains which stood instead of life and spur and reins. Interesting. Seems unlikely, but interesting. A silver sphere which was sent by the Emperor Ferdinand to Suleiman the Great Turk. It was carried unframed by twelve men and reframed in the Grand Signor's preference by the maker of it, who also delivered him a book containing the mystery of using it, of which sphere de Bartus thus writeth. Nor may we smother or forget ungreatly the heaven of silver that was sent but lately from Ferdinando as a famous work unto Byzantium to the greatest Turk, wherein a spirit still moving to and fro made all the engine orderly to go. And though those... Then, though... Though thone spear did always slowly glide, and contrary the other swiftly slide, yet still the stars kept all their courses even with the true courses of the stars in heaven. The sun there shifting in the zodiac, his shining houses never did forsake his pointing path. There in a month his sister fulfilled her course and changing oft her luster, and form of face, now larger, lesser, soon followed the changes of the other moon. So some sort of astronomical thing. Archimedes, a sphere of transparent glass. Okay, another astronomical thing, which is nice in its way. One Mark Scaliosa blacksmith in the year of Christ 1573 made a lock which consisted of 11 pieces of iron, steel, and brass, all which, together with a pipe key to it, weighed but one grain of gold. The same party also made a chain of gold consisting of 43 links to which he fastened the aforementioned lock and key, and putting the chain about the neck of a flea which drew them all about with ease, and all these particulars weighed together but one grain and a half. So, Again, this seems like a kind of early modern urban legend. Maybe it was possible, and if it was possible, maybe it happened. But honestly, that seems unlikely. Cool, though. Fun to think about. So this is a lot of tiny things and different uh, mechanical things. Cornelius van Drebbel, a Dutchman, made an organ that would make an excellent symphony, being placed in the open air and clear sun without the fingers of an organist, but in a shady place it would yield no music. So that's the kind of thing I can see somehow working. He's contrived some way to use some light. 
to get the energy to the device somehow. Oh, an artificer in Rome who made vessels of glass of such a temper that they were as little liable to be broken as those of gold or silver. So again, possible. The, the Romans knew about glass, certainly. Uh, so the guy's throwing the vessel on the ground. <laughs> so he can't break this glass thing. Okay, the gift the artist applauded that he might gain more applause. So he throws it on the ground. No more than the like vessel made of the solidest metal would have sustained thereby, at which Caesar was astonished. The artificer drew an instrument out of his bosom wherewith he suddenly reduced it to its former shape. So was it deformed when it hit the ground? Besides himself were privy the like tempering of glass. When he had told him no, he commanded his head immediately to be stricken off. Awesome. Saying, should this artifice come once to be known, gold and silver would be of as little value as stones in the street. <laughs> okay, well, we know from history that that didn't work. We already have materials that are much better for structural uses than gold and silver, and those precious metals still have the value that they always did. I think it must be a feature of human psychology, so he need not have killed the guy. At Danzig, a city of Prussia, when Mr. Harrison sent a mill which, without help of hands, did saw boards, having an iron wheel which did not only drive the saw, but did also hook in the boards and drive them out to and fro from the saw, Dr. John D. Oh boy! In his mathematical preface before Euclid's, ele uh, Euclid's Elements mentions the like seen by him in Prague, but whether the mill before mentioned or that which he see at Prague moved by wind or water is not set down by either of them. So an early sawmill. Lots and lots of stuff in here. Very cool. I'll link, as I said earlier, the book itself. Let's see. A garden. So garden shenanigans here. In the Duke of Florentine's garden at Pratiline is a statue of Pan sitting upon a stool with a wreathed pipe in his hand and Sphinx, Syrinx, sorry, beckoning him to play upon it. Pan, putting away his stool and standing up, plays upon his pipe. It's a musical automaton. Which done, he looks upon his mistress as expecting thanks from her, but his expectation being frustrate, he sits down with a sad countenance. <laughs> There is also in the same garden another statue of a laundress beating a buck and turning the clothes up and down with her hand and battle door with which she beats them in the water. There is also the statue of Fame loudly sounding her trumpet, an artificial toad creeping up and down, a dragon bowing down his head to drink water and then vomiting up again with diverse other pieces of art. So, all of that seems plausible. There's a ton more. Okay, so that's the end of the mechanical part. Obviously, lots to see in here. So, next video on this book will be Statical Recreations. If you got this far, thank you. I hope it was interesting and Please like and subscribe and come back for more. Thank you very much.